That's what the Lord is telling, on his, telling us in his word. Whosoever is born of God, when you have this new birth experience, it changes your life. And it does not commit sin. Then it says over there, because for the seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Necessary foundation experience. You must be born again. And if you are truly born again, here is the evidence. You will not continue in sin. But that's not the only necessary foundation experience. We go now to John chapter 17 from verse 14. John 17 verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. When you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are taken in a way out of the customs of the world, out of the practices of the world. And because the friends you used to have, you cannot go out with them anymore, the things you used to do, you cannot do anymore. What that means in your life is then that the world will hate you. It says in verse 16, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Whatever Jesus will not enjoy, will not partake of in the world, you will not enjoy, you will not partake of in the world. That's because you are born again. Now in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Only after that sanctification, did you say in verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So then, really according to the mind of Christ, none that is not sanctified will be sent by him. None that is not sanctified will be called by him into the ministry. It might show him that he wants to use him, but the real uh, time of using him will not arrive in the mind of God until he is sanctified. You have to go through verse 17 as an experience, foundation experience. Before you can get into verse 18 to be sent into the ministry by the Lord. And uh, this calls for self-examination. Have you been saved? Have you gone beyond that? Uh, have you been hated by the world? Are you different from the world? And then have you been sanctified? Not just mentioning it. Is there the real evidence of sanctification in your life? Remember once again, sanctification is not what you do for yourself. It is a work, it is a work of God. Because he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 26 and 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse thee to the washing of water by the word. Before you can be sanctified, you'll need to spend some time in the Word. Because it's the Word of God that shows you what sanctification actually means. And what is the need of man that had been saved, born again, to have this experience of being sanctified. And what is the description of the experience of sanctification. And then in verse 27, we're told that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be only and without blemish. That verse 27 explains verse 26. In verse 26, it says that he might sanctify. And then in verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church. When we're sanctified, the church will be glorious. When we're not sanctified, the church will not be glorious. And from the experience we already have in our local churches, you know that uh, the church is far from being glorious. If the church is far from being glorious, it means the church is far from being sanctified. And if we who are called are sanctified and we enjoy the experience and the experience is uh, the capstone and the greatest in our lives. Obviously, what is the greatest in your life is what you're talking about. And because we talk about the people to be sanctified, we'll have a glorious church. Then he tells us the details of being sanctified without spot, without trinkle, without the marks of the old man, without the marks of the old nature. Uh, you know that if the body is wrinkled, it's an evidence that old age is coming. Spiritually, it says, without spot, without trinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, without blemish in your conversation. 
without blemish in your conduct, without blemish in your character, without blemish in even the way you are thinking. So then, sanctification is necessary. Again, remember it is the work of God, not the work of man. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means that until we're sanctified entirely, we're really not fit yet for the work. Because here is what Jesus prayed about before he said, As the Father sent me, even so I send them. But again, remember, after we are born again, and after we are sanctified, we have not laid all the pillars yet. And we cannot start the building of uh, the roof and all the things that we need to put in the building. You have experience with building. And uh, you know that, for example, in this building in which we have, you have some poles that are carrying the roof. Now, if you just have one or two poles, that may not get the job done. You may need more. And until you have put all those poles in places, really in the strict sense, you cannot say that you want to continue the building. The same thing, these foundations, these pillars, these encounters and experiences with the Lord, until we really have them, there is no point in saying that we want to start the building, want to start ministry involvement. In fact, Jesus Christ himself gave us another pillar, another experience that ought to be in our lives before we get involved in the ministry. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Here were disciples that had spent three years or more with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here were disciples that had heard the greatest message and the greatest um, revelation of the word of God they could ever hear from the greatest of preachers, from the very Son of God himself. In fact, these disciples had been involved temporarily, not permanently, temporarily with ministry, but with a limited ministry, not with a wide ministry, because he limited them, and it was temporary. They went out once and came back immediately. These people, he now told them, before you can get into a lifelong, permanent kind of ministry, something has to happen. You repented, that's not enough. You have been born again, that's not enough. I have prayed for your sanctification. He prayed for their sanctification before he died, before he went to the cross. This one that we're reading about is after the cross. And so he told them, after salvation, after sanctification, then he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. There are some people that say that, well, souls are perishing. The work has to be done. We need a number of workers and a lot of workers in our district and in our local church. And uh, we cannot wait for them that uh, we they, they should baptize in the Holy Ghost because we need them so urgently. Other people too will say, I'm needed urgently myself and I, needed to, I need to do the work and I cannot wait for even being sanctified. I cannot wait for being baptized in the Holy Ghost. I need to do something urgently. But Jesus Christ, who knows the need of the world more than you do, who knows the value of his soul more than you do, who knows the importance of the work more than you do, who is interested in the building of the kingdom more than you do, he told these disciples, he said they had to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, says he, ye have heard of me, for John truly really baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, but he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Here Jesus emphasized to them, 
And these were the very last words of Jesus before he was taken from them. If you look at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the very last words of Jesus Christ is that it was not proper for his own saved and sanctified disciples, for his own comforted and reassured disciples, for his own disciples who had received meat from him. After I said, have you any meat? And he said, no. For his own disciples who had seen him, some of them had touched him. After his resurrection, he said it wasn't proper to go out in the world before they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, they said, if they did, they will fail. Salvation is to write your name in the book of life. Sanctification is to prepare you for heaven. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Holy Ghost baptism is to prepare you for service. Salvation is not enough for service. Sanctification is not enough for service. You need the baptism in the Holy Ghost to be successful in the work of the Lord. You are not going to be able to make much headway in the service of the Lord if you neglect uh, the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said, you must not depart from Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. It is when that power has come on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. Home missions cannot be done appropriately without the Holy Ghost. Evangelism cannot be done effectively without the Holy Ghost. Follow-up cannot be done effectively without the Holy Ghost. Bringing people to the kingdom and making them stay in the kingdom cannot be done permanently, effectively without the Holy Ghost. Helping people and teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you cannot be done effectively without the Holy Ghost. And what you are doing will not be fully rewarded without the Holy Ghost. You will not be able to take the right decisions and the proper decisions in making the work to grow without the Holy Ghost. So Jesus Christ told his own disciples, and he said, they must wait in Jerusalem. You see, there are many people that are too much in a hurry. And uh, they also concentrate on the, on the wrong thing. The right thing is make sure that the foundation is there. If the foundation is to be destroyed, what will the righteous do? We must make sure that we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Saved. Sanctified. Spirit-filled. But even after we are spirit-filled, what we learn from the Acts of the Apostles is that these spirit-filled people were very prayerful. Before being baptized, they were prayerful. During the time of being baptized, it made them at the point of prayer. After they were baptized, the Holy Ghost, they continued also in prayer. And if we're going to actually continue to have the infilling, uh, that is, after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, being filled and filled and filled and filled regularly. I don't mean just uh, uh, rattling off in tongues. I don't mean just uh, opening your mouth and doing what you know how to do. I mean the anointing coming upon you afresh. I mean the feeling coming from heaven, not just, uh, you know, repeating those same uh, things you spoke when you were baptized in the Holy Ghost. I mean the anointing and the power and the unction and the revelation coming from the Lord in the Word of God, except those uh, uh, in feelings are there all the time, you will not be able to actually carry on the work. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Well, this is an experience that is uh, different from being saved. Different from being sanctified. Different from being baptized in the Holy Ghost. There are many people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but they have not got this experience of uh, being overwhelmed by the spirit of prayer. They find it easier to talk than to pray. They find it easier to work than to pray. They find it easier to preach than to pray. But we're talking about an experience with God. That you are so much, after you have been saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are so much filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of prayer and supplication is poured upon you. It's an experience. 
And it's an experience that once it begins, if you are able to take care of that experience, if you do every, if you follow on the move of the Spirit of God, then you will discover that anytime, every time, you'll be hungry for prayer, thirsty for prayer. And prayer will become so much a part of your life. Communion with God will become so much a part of your life. Without this experience, you will not do everything you ought to do for the Lord. Even after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you could become such a talkative that all the power will leak away. All the anointing will leak away. You need to sustain and support uh, the experiences you have got with this experience of praying without ceasing. But not only that, you also need the experience or the habit of studying the Bible regularly. In Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, um, that I also call foundation experience. Now, you see, we may come to the church and listen to the word of God. But you might not have got the experience with the Lord. Whereby, if you don't read your Bible, you feel guilty to even take your breakfast. It is not just that you have written it somewhere, no Bible, no breakfast, but it is part of you. And every time you carry it, maybe a small Bible around anywhere you are. And it is so much an experience with you that uh, that Bible is so much part of you, you are reading it all the time. Or it may be that uh, you have a small tape recorder and it may be you have an earphone that goes along with it. That when you are just uh, probably on the road or uh, when you are free, uh, the, the habit you have developed is that you are listening to the word of God every time. It may be a particular message. You have listened to it probably on a particular day in the fellowship. But then you, you have got it and you say, I know there is something there and I want everything there to come into me, to become part of me. Uh, you, may have, you may have to listen to that message seven times, ten times, or fifteen times, and you listen to it, not so much you can preach it, not so much because you want to be able to repeat it, you want it to become part of your daily experience. Now you see, when things are like that, then God will be able to use you. Because you are not empty of the word of God. You are not empty of the spirit of God. Let's move on to number two, useful physical and mental qualities. Those of us who uh, get involved in the ministry will realize that the ministry is uh, very demanding. And it demands that you will make use of your physical energy. If, for example, you are sick or sickly, you may not be able to do everything you ought to do. If, for example, there are some physical impediments, those physical impediments may limit what you are able to do for the Lord. Therefore, you want to make sure that you uh, take care of your physical, the physical part of you, you take care of the mental part of you so that you will be your best for the Lord. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, verse 34. Yea, ye yourselves know that these sons have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. Paul the Apostle there spoke about walking. He said, you know that my hands have ministered to my own necessities. Here we are as workers. Some people feel today that uh, the only time they want to think about the work of God is when they are in full-time service, when they don't have to work with their hand. But here we are told of the example of the greatest apostle. And he said he still worked with his hand, and there's nothing to be ashamed of in that. That didn't lessen from the call of God upon a man's life, upon a woman's life, because he or she is still working with his or her hands. Paul the Apostle, the greatest of uh, apostles, said, You know that my hands have ministered to my necessities. Not only that, I've even ministered unto the necessities of those that are with me. Many sometimes you'll find that people who are lazy, who do not want to work with their hands. Uh, they will even resign their jobs. And they will say, God has spoken to them. 
that they ought to work for God. And because God has spoken to them, they ought to work for God. They abandon work and they become beggars. They begin to beg from this and beg from that. And be, they become a reproach to the gospel. We need some physical qualities and some mental qualities. We're told in Romans chapter 12 verse 11. Romans chapter 12 verse 11. Not lawful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, a person can keep on in, in business maybe in marketing, in trading, in um, farming, in carpentry, in the electrician's job, or wiring houses, or office work, or being a teacher, or being a nurse, or being an engineer, or doing a, any kind of work, and yet he is not slothful in his business. In his business, it's dutiful, it's honest, it's upright, it's hardworking, it's very industrious, and yet at the same time, it's fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Some people feel that if you are going to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord, you need to abandon the job you are doing. And you need to just uh, be looking up to all the other people and members in the district church or the local church. They feel that that is a mark of being called by God in the real sense. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Here we find physical quality telling us of what a person that is going to be a leader or a king has to be. In the midst of the people of God, it says, woe unto that land, woe unto that community, woe unto that local church, when the leadership there, when those who say they are workers, they do not know how to regulate their eating. They do not know how to regulate their, their sleeping. They do not know how to regulate and manage their time. It says, woe unto them, unto that land, when the king, when the king is a child. That is, when the king is not mentally developed. When the king is so dull, when the king is so childish. And do you know that uh, you know, a, a person can be born again and still acting childishly? Do you know a person may be sanctified and he, he still act childishly? You do know a person may even profess to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and be acting childishly, talking childishly, eating childishly, sleeping childishly. But it says, one to that group of people, when the king, when the leader there, is, uh, he rises up in the morning and the first thing he's thinking about is, what am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? He doesn't think of what am I going to do during the day. What are the important things I need to think about during the day? But then it says, blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is a son of the nobles. How do you know the king of the nobles? You know, the way those people carry themselves the way they are sound and healthy, the way they dress themselves up, the way they are militant, and the way, the way they walk and the way they do everything, you can tell that this is one of the sons of the nobles. And thy princes eat in due season. Thy princes eat in due season for strength, not for drunkenness, not for indulgence. You see, these are some physical things that we need to take care of as leaders in the vineyard of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And in verse 5. What thou in all things and due afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. It says, watch in all things. It says, do the work of an evangelist. Then it says, make full proof of thy ministry. Three things. Watch, walk, make full proof of their ministry. That is, do it in such a way that your ministry will be approved by God and by the angels of God. Then, uh, everything. What supports all that? The watching, the walking, and the making proof of your ministry. What supports all that? It is enduring affliction. Enduring affliction. Enduring affliction. You see, the world in which we live, there, there's going to be affliction. There are going to be some physical difficulties. It may be the physical difficulty in the body. 
It may be physical difficulties in your place of work. It may be physical difficulties in the extended family. It may be some afflictions uh, that come as a result of misunderstanding from people. You see, the person that is so weak, the person that is always complaining, the person that is saying, how can I preach? How can I walk? How can I talk to other people when I have this problem and I have this problem with me? Endure affliction. That's part of the physical thing we have to go through. You see, there are times that uh, your landlord may be pulling trouble with you. There are times that your in-laws may be pulling trouble with you. There are times it may be that uh, there is delay in children coming to the family. There are times in which uh, you are not in the best physical state or situation that you like to be. But then it says, endure afflictions. Afflictions in the plural. If you don't endure that, then how can you work for God? There are times that your marriage is delayed. And there are times that you think about you have to go to the market as a bachelor, as a spinster, and you have to cook this for yourself and do this for yourself, endure afflictions. There are times you feel lonely. And you see, in those situations, what makes a person really a minister is that none of these things move me. Those afflictions and those limitations and those difficulties and the peculiar weaknesses of your human body, none of these things move me. Even the persecution coming from your husband, the persecution coming from your family or from your relatives, endure afflictions. You see, these are some of the things that many people do not take care of and they fail in the ministry. They are not well qualified in Philippians chapter 4 verse 12. Philippians chapter 4 verse 12. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You see, a person that is not able to adjust himself and be able to live in every kind of condition, he will not be able to do the work of the Lord successfully. Here Paul the Apostle says, I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. You see, some people can only work best when everything is all right. We've got land for our district. We'll build our district church. All the fluorescent tubes, none is missing. The loudspeaker is working well. All the, the ground is uh, all cemented. And the, the floor is all right. And all the chairs and the benches are of the finest quality. And everything you can see, well, you know, all around that district church, everything is physically in place. That's the only time some people can preach. That's the only time some people can do the Christian work. But when it appears that um, the ground is not yet flawed, or it appears that this time of the rain, the rain is sometimes being blown into the church auditorium, or it appears that the roof is leaking. Or it appears that uh, the loudspeaker is not working well. Or once the rain comes on the generator, and now the generator is not functioning well. And then the fellow, you have to, you know, be, even as you are taking care of the generator, you have to take care of him. And you have to be encouraging him, the rain will soon stop. Uh, don't just cancel the Bible study like that. Don't tell them to go back home. Don't make any rash announcement that they should go. Uh, the rain will stop. And even if the rain does not stop, we can still try. And we can do it this way. And one usher will come and say, we're trying our best. It will be all right. Don't announce yet. Another person will come. Uh, we're trying our best. Don't announce yet. Another fellow will come. And then after five minutes has gone, he's fed up already. And then he calls uh, for the person and the generator. You have not finished and he said, uh, just a few moments more. Well, I'm going to announce, I'm going to send the people home because I don't know. If God is with us, why should we have difficulties like this? The people will say, look at our church now. Look at this condition. What are the newcomers going to say? You know, if you are going to really succeed in the ministry, you will know how to abound. You will know how to be abased. And you know, there are times that uh, you are going to the fellowship. And it may be that one way or the other. Uh, your wife or your maid has uh, gone to buy food, uh, the, the raw food, they stop, so that they'll come and cook. But because of the traffic uh, hold up, and because of some other reasons beyond the control of your wife, the food is late. 
and here you are, you are hungry. And you will say, well, I, I don't know whether I will be able to go today. Uh, which zonal leader can I send to? Or if you are a zonal leader, uh, which place, which person will I tell that uh, uh, help me tell coordinator I cannot come? You don't want to give the reason because uh, my stomach is stronger than my heart. And I don't have anything in my stomach and because of that, my heart will not work for God. My heart will not respond to the meeting today. And therefore, you will say, uh, just tell the uh, leaders over there, if they don't see me, it's because of uh, something that is uh, beyond my control. Uh, therefore, uh, if they don't see me, help me that somebody will take my place. Well, somebody might take your crown eventually too. You see, we should be able to know how to abase and how to, ab how to be abased and how to abound. Then it says, in all things and everywhere, in all things and everywhere, I am instructed. I am instructed, just like we are instructing one another now. I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Some people, if they suffer any need at all, they are going to be saying, they will ask me, where is your God? Where is your God? Well, that you're hungry doesn't mean that God has died. God may allow you to be hungry so as to develop some qualities in you. So as to develop some characteristics in you. And so we know that all these things are very important. I've spoken on studying the word of God. It is very necessary that we study the word of God. Now summarizing this a second part, let me give you these points you may want to put down. Leadership in any area of God's work is a great responsibility, and it demands some physical, mental qualities. Leadership de demands, number one, courageous action. You've seen that in the life of Paul the Apostle, that he had courageous actions. If you see, if you look at all the things that befell him, in all the places he preached, you'll see courage and you'll see purposeful action. Number two, health, healthy or health-promoting habits. Healthy or health promoting habits. I've read to you in the Ecclesiastes already uh, where it talks about our eating and it's uh, warning us against self indulgence in eating. You see, there is a kind of uh, eating that uh, doesn't promote your health, there is a kind of uh, eating habit uh, that will just uh, make you weak. But if you regulate what you eat, you regulate how you eat, your space or your time. How you eat, you may be developing health promoting habits. Number three, well directed energy. You see, the, we need physical energy to do the work of God. And uh, you should be involved with every part of the work of God in your district. And you need to direct your energy very well, very well, so that you are not just spending all your time on point on one thing, and then you are not uh, involved in the other things that need your attention. Number four, lively or life-inspiring vision. Lively or life-inspiring vision. If we're going to do the work successfully, we need vision. Paul the Apostle said, I'm not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but it should be, uh, be life-inspiring vision. The kind of vision that will inspire the people around you. And you will tell them that, brethren, this is what we need to do. This, our district will need to grow. We need to evangelize and speak to all people concerning the gospel. And you need to know how to pass the vision unto them. Number five, purposeful achievement-oriented time management. You see all those things that we have read uh, concerning Paul the Apostle, concerning um, what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. We need uh, purposeful time management. Because a lot of things need to be done. You think of Paul the Apostle, that he did missionary work. He worked with his hand. He wrote epistles. He did a lot of things. He encouraged people. He counseled people. And he had to order his time. He had to work out his time. Time management is very important. And those of us who are women, and you're involved in the work of God, you have a husband to take care of. You have your children to take care of, and you have probably an office work to look into, and also you have the church work to look into if you do not have uh, achievement-oriented time management, purposeful time management. How are you going to be able to do it? It's either you will be a good wife but a bad mother, or you could be a good mother to your children but a bad wife, not knowing how to take care of your husband, 
Or you could be a good wife and a good mother, but then you could be an indolent, ineffective worker in the church of the living God. If you are going to be up to date, up to expectation in the work of the Lord, in the work, in your place of work, and also as a mother and as a wife, you are going to need to manage your time. Women, the same thing, that you need to be a good husband as well as a good father. You see, it is very easy to be a good husband but a bad father because, you know, wife is only one, children maybe three or four. And you need more attention on these children because, you see, there are four of them or there are five of them, and each child is different from the other child. And if you're going to be a good father, you need to know the characteristics of each of these children and know how to bring them up. Can you say you are a good husband as well as a good father and also a good and worker, effective worker in your place of work as well as efficient in the work of the Lord in the church? For you to balance up everything like that, you need purposeful time management, achievement to re-enter time management. Number six, industry and hard work. Industry and hard work. Obviously, with everything that we have to do, we cannot be lazy, we cannot be indolent. Uh, because if we're indolent, we're going to leave a lot of things undone in our various uh, involvements in the work of the Lord. Number seven, regulated sleep and eating habits. Regulated sleep and eating habits. If you don't sleep well, it's going to affect your uh, mental output. Uh, you are going to be a person that always looks tired. A person that is not able to think very well. A person that is not well coordinated. A person that is always suffering fatigue all the time. And your body is not going to cooperate with you very well if you are not eating well and you are not sleeping well. So you need to regulate your sleep. Not too much sleep, not too little sleep. Know how much sleep your body actually needs. And give it to your body so that you can be your best when you are awake. Number eight, alertness, wisdom, and self-control. Alertness. You're very alert. You're sharp-sighted. You're alert because uh, whatever is happening in your vicinity, in your environment, you're very sharp. You're able to say, how about this? And then when you see things that are happening, you couple your alertness with wisdom. You know how to approach and how to address the issue that needs to be addressed. Then self-control. There are times you will keep it in afterwards, according to Proverbs. That all the things you know, you can't relate everything now. You still want to put yourself under control. As a leader, your tongue must be under control. A leader among the marriage committee brethren, your tongue has to be under control. That, this, that person that has come to the marriage committee, living in the same yard with you, is not going to hear anything of the decisions or deliberations of the marriage committee from your mouth, even though you are living together. And it's, that's going to take self-control. Your own junior brother, your own junior sister is uh, planning to get married and is living with you. You happen to be in the marriage committee. It's going to take real leadership and self-control. For you to hear all those things in the marriage committee and come back home and not say one word about what is going on in the marriage committee. You see, that is leadership. You need alertness. You need wisdom and you need self-control. Number nine. Firm control on your tongue and interpersonal relationships. Firm control on your tongue and interpersonal relationships. You need to be able to control yourself as a leader. You see, there are times you have heard something about a particular sister, a particular brother. But the thing has not been confirmed. And you have not checked up all the details you want to check up. You want to be able to control your emotion. You want to be able to control your attitude. You want to be able to control your words because you cannot act yet. You have not got all the facts you want to get. And so you need firm control on your tongue and your interpersonal relationships. Number 10, self-forgetfulness, ability to bear shocks and not always protecting or defending self. Don't we need that? As leaders in the vineyard of the Lord, we need all this uh, ability. Number one, that you forget yourself in the service of other people. 
this is uh, the mental makeup that you need or the mental ability that you need that I will forget about that thing now. I will not talk about it now because that relates to myself and also ability to bear shocks. Uh, do you know there are some things that will come to you as shocks? Uh, for example, uh, you are in the uh, pulpit and you are about to preach. And one of the people that uh, you love very much, and uh, you love how you love him, not because of anything material, not because of anything physical, but because you know the dedication of this individual. You know the ability of this individual. You know the love, the commitment of this individual. And you know how serviceable this individual had been in the church of the living God in your local church. And then all of a sudden you heard that this individual backslid or did something that shook you to your very heart, to your very root. And just about uh, 10 minutes to that time, uh, after that time you are going to preach. How are you going to be able to preach with all that in your mind? You might be so shaking that you will not know you are going to say what you are going to say. You need to forget yourself. You need to be able to bear shocks when they occur. And not always protecting and defending yourself. There are times that people are going to misunderstand you. There are times that people are going to say that you have done what you have not done. You have said what you have not said. And leadership demands that you will not protect yourself. You will not defend yourself. Now, I don't mean that in your district, if uh, you know that um, you are bought land and there you are, you are preaching, and somebody who is uh, just a thug wanting to, you know, take that land and wanting to make trouble, there you are in the district, and the ushers tell you that, uh, you know, some people are coming, they want to fight, and uh, some uh, people are going to hurt anybody they can find. I don't mean that you'll say, ushers, don't worry. I heard on the Saturday meeting, they said we should not protect ourselves. So security people uh, go and sit in congregation. I was just sit in congregation. Uh, if they want to kill me, let them come and kill me. No. You know that Paul the Apostle, when some 40 people made uh, a vow, they said they are not going to sleep and they are not going to do any other thing until they kill Paul. And then the son of the, uh, the cousin or the uncle came to tell him and said, this is what they had said. Well, Paul the Apostle did not say, well, I'm Apostle, leave them alone, don't worry about that, just go your way. He said, come, take this boy to go and tell uh, the fellow in authority. And he took that boy there and he said, this is what the Jews are planning. And he said, okay, I will do something about it. Don't tell anybody. The point of security is still there. What I'm talking about when I say don't protect yourself and don't defend yourself is that people might tell lies against you. Or people might say some things about you that you know are not true. What are you going to do as a leader? Uh, forget yourself. Don't uh, defend yourself in such an area. Also, laziness must be avoided by all means. Laziness must be avoided by all means. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we're looking at verse 18. By much slothfulness the building decays, and through, the, through idleness of the hands, the whole, the house drop it through. Now, do you see here that we should not be lazy, we should not be idle, because we see through idleness. And uh, through slothfulness, the house will decay. Many of the things that have been built up and many of the things the Lord has helped us in, if we're not very industrious, we're not hardworking, if we're lazy, always sleeping, always missing meeting because of a little problem here, a little, a little problem there, if we're always missing meetings, we're not going to be able to be and do what we ought to do and what we ought to be. When I go to point three, Indispensable spiritual qualities. Indispensable spiritual qualities. We're looking at John chapter 13, verse 15. John 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In leadership, that verse is very, very important. Jesus said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You see those two important verses? The Lord is telling us on the one hand that we shall follow his example. 
Paul is telling us, on the other hand, he is following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, you have him also as an example, that you can follow his own example, Paul the Apostle. So then, in leadership, as in everything else, Jesus is our perfect example. We do not have time to read uh, many references now because of time, but let me just give you 10 points. As we follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in spiritual leadership, indispensable spiritual qualities. Number one, a leader lives a life above sin and above reproach. Isn't that what we find in the life of Jesus Christ and in the life of Paul the Apostle? A leader lives a life above sin and above reproach. Remember, as a leader, you represent God before the people. You represent your church in your local church. You represent um, your local church too before the people you are counseling. When people look at you, they don't look at you just as an individual. They look at you as a representative of the church you belong to, of the church you are serving. That means then, if you are driving your vehicle on the road, remember, you are representing the church. If you are dealing with somebody who has wronged you on the road, somebody has, uh, you know, obeyed or not obeyed the traffic and has come your way and he is strong and you are right. Remember when the tendency is there to shout and to do anything, remember who you represent. Or it may be that in your place of work, they are trying to cheat you. And uh, you know that this is not right. Remember who you represent because, you know, they identify you with a church like this. Or it may be at the time you are planning marriage. Uh, they are telling you, well, if you really want to marry, you go and bring this and you go and bring that. Re remember that you, re you represent the church. And because you represent God and represent the church, and to them, you are the very standard of Bible teaching. You want to be very careful how you live. Remember, between you and your wife, between you and your children, in everything you do and everything you say, in the places you go and the places you don't go, you represent the church. If uh, marriage is going on in the district, although the person getting married is very close to you, although the person getting married is a very close brother, a very close sister, but remember that you represent the church. And therefore, you cannot just act and say, well, I will, I will go there, I will do this, I will do that. If you have a child and they are thinking of naming ceremony, remember you are not just an isolated individual, you represent the church. People are going to be looking at what you do and they are going to be saying, if he did that, that's the standard. Because of this, you want to make sure that you are living above reproach. Above reproach. You live above sin, you also live above reproach. Number two, a leader must be deserving of trust. You see, as we look at the life of Jesus Christ, and we look at the life of Paul the Apostle, we see this quality that they were deserving of trust. Uh, the disciples of Jesus had so much confidence in him. He was worthy that they should place the trust in him. Why? He never told any lie. He never promised what he will not do. He never threatened without carrying it out. He never did anything that he didn't expect. He always walked according to the word of God. He always lived by the leading of the spirit of God. I always do the things that are pleasing to the Father. And he knew that in every difficulty, he always behaved himself like a leader ought to behave himself. In the stormy sea, when the Pharisees were after him, when persecution came, he, he behaved like a leader ought to behave. And even when Judas Iscariot became to betray him, in all those difficulties, they saw his life and they saw that this is the way he should have acted. Remember that as a leader, people are watching you. When people go against you, they are watching your action. When you have a need in your life, they are watching your action. And you want to be a person that is trust worthy. Your life, your utterances, and all your actions shall convince others that you are trustworthy. Number three, the leader lives by faith, therefore he's always taking initiative. You see, a leader must live by faith. A leader is not uh, planning uh, because of the conditions in which we are now. And uh, he will say, well, although the Lord said this is what we ought to do, but we cannot plan like that now because, after all, we know the condition in which we are now in the country. 
Although this is the word of God and this is the uh, demand of God upon our lives, but you know, we cannot plan big like that now and do that now because uh, you know our limitations. Although we know that the word of God says, without holiness no man shall see the Lord, and we know we ought to preach holiness, but you know now as the people are suffering, if we emphasize holiness, they are not going to come. So you see, a leader will lead by faith, and by faith they will take initiative. What does a leader do in trying to take initiative? Five things. Number one, he identifies what they need. You find them in your district, in your local church, there is a need. You want to identify with that need. Identify with that need. Now, if you're a coordinator, you're always traveling. Uh, maybe you're traveling almost every weekend. And you are never there. How do you even know the need in that district? And if you know the need in that district, how are you able to identify with the need when you are not even there? Number two, the leader crystallizes the problem. That is, you look at the problem. After you have identified with the need, you crystallize the problem. You focus on the problem. You analyze the problem. You know that this is actually the problem. Number three, you prayerfully produce the solution. Not just, uh, you know, uh, giving out or uh, bringing just out of your head, out of past experience, prayerfully. You go to the Lord in prayer and you prayerfully provide, produce the solution. Number four, you delegate responsibility impartially. You see, after you have identified what the need, you crystallize the problem and then you produce a solution. Now, as you are going to work out that solution, you need people to be able to carry out the work along with you. You delegate responsibility. How you do you do it? You do it impartially. Impartially means that uh, you are not just calling brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so because you like him or you like her. Impartially, you look at all the people in the fellowship and very sincerely, impartially, you give to the people that can actually handle it. Number five, you walk alongside others till the desired result is achieved. You walk alongside others till the desired result is achieved. I said... Um, uh, you know, these 10 points that you need to understand about the indispensable spiritual qualities. Number one, a leader must live above sin, above reproach. Number two, he must be deserving of trust. Number three, he lives by faith and therefore he takes initiative. Now number four, he uses good judgment and does not gamble with essentials. A leader, if he's going to lead very well, he uses good, sound judgment in taking decisions and whatever the problem whatever the difficulties he will never gamble with essentials never you never gamble with essentials a spirit-led leader does not initiate anything that is not already been initiated by the holy spirit he does not depend on majority decision you see, in the, in the church, you cannot depend on majority decision because you might be fooled by the mixed multitude. And you want to remember Kadesh Bania. You want to remember that it was a majority decision. They began to cry, saying that they could not go into the land of Canaan at that time. The minority decision was, let us go up at once because we are well able. And but then, they couldn't follow the minority decision. Caleb and Joshua, because of that, they spent the rest uh, of their lives, many of them, in the wilderness. For 40 years, they were roaming about. Therefore, you never, never joke, you never gamble, you never play with essentials. For the church today, the doctrines are very essential. You cannot gamble with them. We cannot say because we want more people to come to the church, we want the number to rise up very quickly. We want this. We want that. We cannot say because of that, we're going to gamble with the essentials. Number five, a leader speaks with God-given authority. A leader speaks with God-given authority where he does not know God's mind on an issue. Through scripture and through prayer, he will have to keep quiet until he's sure. You see, you can only speak with God-given authority if you are sure. And uh, that's, uh, that's a spiritual quality. It means you are going to be quiet a lot of time. You see, sometimes they will press you and press you and press you that uh, something should be done. Uh, but if you do not know God's mind, you, you just overlook that pressure and you don't do anything. Let me just remind you, we don't have the time to look at all the passages. But in the case of David, in his family, 
You remember what happened? That um, the, the sister of Absalom had been defiled, Tamar. And because of that, Absalom had this in mind that he was going to kill the individual that did that. He just told Tamar, his sister, and said, Oh, has your brother been with you? Never mind, it's your brother after all. Don't, uh, don't cry and don't do anything. And then he went to David after some time. And they said, David, I've got uh, all my sheep, and they have done all this. And I want the king and all the sons of the king to come with me so that we can make merry, you can rejoice with me. And David said, why? Should we be chargeable unto you? It is not necessary. And Absalom pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. And uh, David said, no, it's not necessary. Okay, then um, uh, he said, Absalom said, if the king is not going to come, let all the king's sons, let them come. And uh, David said, no, not necessary. He pressed him. David said, no. When he pressed him, then he said, all right, they can go. Absalom had already given a commandment to his own servant. He said, when the people are merry, then when I say strike Amnon, you strike him immediately. And so he, you know, got all the people together, the sons of the king. And while their hearts were merry, they killed Amnon. And when David heard, David even thought all the children had died. And then somebody said, no, not everybody, just Amnon. It's because of what he did to Tamar. That is why Absalom has planned that. But you know something? David was the king. And David could have said no. And he said no. But Absalom pressed him and pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. So you see, pressure is very delicate for leadership. Not only that, you, do you know that eventually, uh, when Absalom had done that, he ran away. And he ran away for three years. And eventually, Joab, Joab uh, was, you know, were the captain of the host of uh, the children of Israel with David. And then Joab went to get a person, a woman from Tekoa. And they said, go and talk to David, that he will bring his banish back home. And David, you see, didn't learn a lesson. Didn't learn a lesson because, you see, this woman came to tell like a parable, like a story. But you remember, when Nathan came to talk to David some time ago, it was through a parable. And, you know, he just gave the judgment after listening to the parable, and then uh, Nathan sat down at the man. Eventually, now, this woman of Tekoa came and fed a particular mode of talking. And after talking this way, and this old, uh, David said, you can go, I will look into your case. Nobody will touch your son. And then he says, let it not displease my lord the king. Because my king, the king is like an angel. And uh, is it right that uh, you will not bring the banished back home? Eventually, then David said, okay. It's not the hand of Job with you in this matter. And then he said, oh king, I will not deceive you because nobody can hide anything from you. Uh, the hand of Job is with me. So he called Job. He said, okay, tell the young man to come. While the young man is coming, then uh, David uh, thought, this is a dangerous boy. Let him go to his city. Don't let him see my face. He can come back into the land, but don't let him see my face. And eventually Absalom uh, said, Joab, I want to see the king. Absalom did not answer. Second time, I want to see the king. Abs uh, Joab did not answer. So Absalom said, go and set his field on fire. And so Joab said, why have you set my field on fire? And uh, so this uh, Absalom said, I said I wanted to see the king. If I'm guilty, let him kill me. And then eventually he came to see the king. And as he saw the king, you see the pressure. It's because they put pressure on David. And he allowed the young man to come. And then everything was settled. And as, as uh, David was uh, on his throne, uh, Absalom, now that the pressure has quietened David, and, you know, he was now allowing Absalom to be anything, all this mischievous work he was doing at the court. And he would say, your case is good. This could have been done. This could have been done. And eventually he got all the people. Before David knew anything, they said, Absalom reigneth. And David had to run out. You know what caused it? Pressure. Pressure on David. And so you need to understand as leader in your district, you never yield to pressure. They will bring pressure from this and pressure from that and pressure from every direction. If you don't know the mind of the Lord yet, just say, I understand what you are saying. I know that this is very important to you. Give me time. Give me time. Because you know, even Absalom could not take the step until David gave him the permission. The respect was still there. The leadership was still there. It was the pressure that broke down uh, the hand of uh, the authority of David. And eventually that, is that was very costly. It's always very costly for leadership. 
leadership in your local church and leadership in the central church leadership everywhere to yield unto pressure i'm going to number six a leader strengthens and encourages others you see as a leader in your district you have to strengthen and you have to encourage others the details you strengthen the weak you see the people that are weak one way or the other maybe they are weak in the way they think they're weak because of the family problems they have they're weak because of the problems in their places of work their hands have been weakened you strengthen the weak number two comfort the sorrowful there are people that will be bereaved make sure that you are involved in comforting them there are people that might uh, lose um, you know children or lose anybody in the family comfort them or they lose some um, valuables in their family comfort them then you encourage the faint-hearted there are people in the district church you'll find that they are faint-hearted and what do you do you encourage them but then number four you are going to warn the unruly warn the unruly the people that take laws into their hands let them know there is a leader in that local church it's not right in your zone if uh, you know people are unruly and you say well i'm just a zonal leader there's nothing i can do it's not right in your house fellowship or in your area anywhere you are as a leader and you, the people are unruly and they you know cause uh, confusion well i'm just uh, i'm just a little person here there's nothing i can do and as a women coordinator in your district church, uh, you see a particular woman that is uh, uh, destroying the doctrine of the word of God, going about to destabilize the work of the women in the district. Uh, well, I'm just a woman coordinator. What voice do I have? God placed you there. Make sure that you warn the unruly. You strengthen the weak. You comfort the sorrowful and you encourage the faint-hearted. Number seven, a leader is joyful and full of faith. And it's enthusiastic and optimistic in times of problems. You see, a leader must have uh, this outgoing uh, kind of attitude. Not somebody who's always himself very discouraged, himself uh, downhearted, himself is faint-hearted, himself he cannot take decision. Let uh, as a leader be joyful at all times in all things. Whatever may be your present physical condition, be joyful, be full of faith, be enthusiastic, be optimistic. In times of problems, in times of problems, you ought to focus on the goal and the objective, not on the obstacles. Obstacles there will be. Problems there will be. But please, as a leader, realize that you are to focus on the goal, you are to focus on the objective, not on the obstacles. Number eight. A leader leads by example. He practices what he preaches. Why does he have to practice what he preaches? To show that it is possible to do it. To show that the grace of God is available to others to obey the word of God. So a leader practices what he preaches. He leads by example. Number nine, a leader activates people to action while he leads the way to success. You see, when you, when you are leading as a leader, you activate the people to action. You activate the people to purposeful action, goal-directed action. A leader activates people to action while he leads the way to success. Number 10. He never compromises the absolute truths that God has revealed, whatever the cost, whatever others may do. Whatever the cost, Whatever others may do, a leader never compromises the absolute truths. The doctrines of the Bible are not relative, they are absolute. The doctrines of the Bible are not uh, some kind of things we can bring on the discussion table and say that, well, some of the rich people that have been coming, uh, they have problem with this restitution. They have problem with um, sanctification. They have a problem with one man, one wife. Well, as a leader, you cannot compromise the absolute truth of the word of God. That stands as long as there is ministry. Once that is removed, the ministry is removed. In your own life, you cannot compromise those absolutes. In your family, you cannot compromise those absolutes. And in the local church or central church, 
We cannot compromise those absolutes. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Take heed to thyself. Make sure that all these spiritual qualities of being born again, being sanctified, being filled or baptized with the Spirit of God, developing the prayer life and the prayer habits, having assurance concerning the doctrines of the Bible, and also the physical qualities that were mentioned. Take heed unto thyself. And indispensable spiritual qualities that were mentioned. Take heed unto thyself. Don't be forgetful. And make sure that every time you remember as a leader, you represent Christ, you represent God, you represent the kingdom of God and the church you belong to. And also unto the doctrine. Take heed unto the doctrine. You cannot compromise the absolute doctrine, the absolute truth of the word of God, not even under pressure. Continue in them. Because it's only in doing this you'll save yourself and you'll save the people that hear you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer.